This is another Poet at War General Report. And here's your general, Joshua David Ling. What's up, everybody? It's time for another General's Report. Or General Report, whatever it is. <laughs> uh, this is Joshua David Ling coming at you again from my porch. I had an interview this past week that I was going to have, but ended up running into, like most freelancers, too little time. I was going to be Chad Lewis. We're going to get him on later. He's actually working on an awesome uh, animated film that he's going to be crowdfunding here real soon. And we're going to talk to him about that once I get it rescheduled and go from there. I also have an interview coming up tomorrow, as in I'm in doing the interview tomorrow. Not It's not coming out tomorrow necessarily, although it might. Who knows? With uh, Daniel Reed of the... Wonder Brood and uh, his brother. So they are interesting individuals and they'll be talking to us about lots of things. I know one thing Daniel uh, on Daniel's heart is he has uh, partial deafness and he does some really interesting things with sign language and storytelling and the like. So we'll be talking to them. Uh, today I wanted to talk to you about names. Names are something that are very close to my heart. My children have a bajillion of them. A lot of people think it's a little bit weird, but I'm going to go into why they have so many names. Now, they don't, uh, the fantasy names, which are their real names, but they are not their legal names. Uh, those are come after the middle name before the last name. Uh, they are not legal. They are family names uh, only. Uh, they, they have a normal first, middle, last. I think that's very important for children to be able to fit into the society where they need to fit in and stand out where they need to stand out. Uh, and in this case, they stand out in the family with strange names. Um, I don't mind giving them out because, you know, some people worry about that. Uh, but I'm not going to go into them immediately. Let me just go into this. Uh, Christening is a medieval terminology that has been uh, used by the church and the Roman Catholic Church still uses it to this day, to my knowledge. Uh, I'm not sure if every little sect uh, within the church, um, the Roman Catholic Church, that is, still takes the medieval meaning. Uh, I could be wrong. Um, Sarah could correct me on this. But christening generally meant that you are being given a name by your parents, but also by the authority of Christ and the church. Uh, they are, they are being stamped with an identity. Uh, they are being stamped with a destiny in some sense, and they are being given, uh, and this is connected to the covenant of baptism, um, which in Presbyterian and, uh, Catholic circles and other circles of that nature that do baptize infants, this is, the name is in fact somewhat of a duty that the child has to grow up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Um, this might be a little bit strange and or mystical to some of my Baptist listeners. Just go with me on this and take a listen. Uh, in a very real and practical sense, I want my children to always have stamped on their very identity a reminder of Christ. And each of my two children have that. Um, now, that's, that's a very practical sense. Let me go back to the mystic sense for just a second. Uh, a lot of people uh, say there is or there isn't magic in words. Now, of course, there's obviously evil black word magic and stuff like that, and that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this world was created by word, by word of an almighty God. His word has the power to actually create ex nihilo. Our word can create uh, out of concepts of this world. We can use the relative definition or the, the, the objective definition to create uh, of, of various words to create relative and fictional worlds. 
Now, those don't have a physical existence that we know of, um, but they are uh, other, other than the words on the page, you know, or in your Word document. So my point is this. If someone names you Sam and someone in a room who doesn't even know you says, Sam, do you turn your head? That is a power that your name has over you. Now, you're sure you can not turn, but your name compels you. Your name compels you to respond. And so that's just a really simple, practical way to bind the practical side and the magical side of names. And when I say magical, I mean supernatural. I mean uh, the way the Bible and uh, nature connect these two things. So now let's get on to my children's names. Now, when Casey and I started to name our children, this came a little bit after we named Hazel, our firstborn, but we did retroactively add some names to her name for the family. And we purposefully did the, the, the same with Peter when he came around. And we have also given each other uh, fantasy names. There are four fantasy series that mean a lot to our family. We constantly do them as uh, read-alouds in addition, of course, to Scripture. Um, not during Scripture. These are separate times. These are separate entertainment times. Uh, the first of which is The Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. Second is uh, The Legendarium, uh, mainly The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit from J.R.R. Tolkien. Uh, following that is the Song of Albion trilogy by Stephen Lawhead. And fourth is the Wingfeather Saga by Andrew Peterson. These four stories have meant a lot to me and guided me and shown me ways in which the world that I live is very deeply connected to uh, the scripture. So deeply connected that the two cannot be separated entirely. Um, there are evil people in the world who seek the separation, but it cannot ever be fully accomplished. Uh, and the world is being reclaimed by Christ throughout history. So with that being said, let's go into their names a little bit and I'll explain the reasons why I actually take their names and use them as mini sermons that I preach to them when they are tired or, you know, going to sleep or just need comfort. Hazel is her first name. That's my firstborn. Hazel is the name of my great grandmother, her great great grandmother. My, uh, my father's father's mother. And she was uh, an amazing woman who helped raise my father. And we wanted to get, uh, honor my father, who was dealing with cancer. Uh, around the time that she was born. We wanted to honor him with her name. So that's why we decided to name her Hazel. And we just liked the name. And so what I tell Hazel is, we named you Hazel because you are to be a mother of our people. Her middle name is Anne. Now I could go into a whole podcast on Anne alone. There are so many connections with the name Anne. And I, uh, I'll tell you what I tell her about Anne in just a moment. That kind of sums it up. But let me just say that my whole life, there has been a, it, almost like the hidden Mickeys at Disney World. There's always an Anne here or an Anne there when I know that, 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 that really is, a sign that I, that's the direction I'm supposed to go. I know that sounds crazy, but it really has been providential. One of the family history things is Queen Anne sent a ship called Anne to take my people from uh, Krottendorf, Germany, back in the 1700s to the United States. Uh, and those were my first German ancestors, the Lings, that came here. So with that being said, uh, I tell Hazel, we named you Anne. Because God has led us along mysterious ways through that name. Her first 
uh, fantasy name is from Narnia. And we always start with Narnia. My father uh, read the Chronicles of Narnia to me as a child, and I have very fond memories of that. Her Narnian name is Erebus. Being the eldest and being that most of the eldest, including myself and my family, are very headstrong, uh, I wanted to give some names that would demonstrate to her that um, there are times when women are called to headstrongness and then there are times where they are not. Um, men are called to headstrongness in the right direction constantly, always. And women are generally called to submit to a headstrong husband, not who's headstrong against her, but headstrong for the truth. And she is to follow um, and not necessarily blaze her path all the time. This is something that we see in scripture. There are times to blaze paths as a woman, uh, especially when you are in right position to your federal head. That is a concept in scripture we'll get into at another time, probably. Um, I chose Erebus because Erebus's story is one of rebellion, right rebellion, against her father, uh, who was trying to marry her off. And she did some very bad things in the process, uh, including getting one of her slave girls whipped. And she received lashes from Aslan that were equal to those lashings. But she was right to leave, and she was right to go. And so what I tell her about Erebus, the name Erebus, I named you Erebus because you are a rebellious son, or excuse me, a rebellious daughter of the king um, who got, uh, basically you will be a rebellious daughter of the king. And then the next name is Eowyn from Lord of the Rings. Much the same story. I tell, I say it to her again in a slightly different way. If you don't know about Eowyn, go read the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> but I tell her that I named you Eowyn because you will face great darkness and you will rebel against that darkness, but it's love that will save you. And then her next name is one from the Song of Albion, and it is Scatha. Scatha was a woman who was a mother to warriors. She taught them warfare. She was actually uh, part of her own small sect on the Isle of Skye, and she did not have allegiance to any king, but all the kings had allegiance to her, and she was the one who trained the warriors. They were sent off to her school. So that is Scatha, and I tell Hazel, I named you Scatha because I want you to be a mother of warriors. And then lastly, her, uh, her wing feather name is Nia. Nia is the mother character in uh, the wing feather saga who takes care of the three children who are our main protagonists in the story. And she has lost her kingdom and her king, and she is still fighting and still moving forward. And so I tell her, tell Hazel, that I named her Nia so that she would be a mother of kings. So all of those things lead to our last name. Our last name comes from Lunk which is L-A-N-G-K-E in the German. Uh, it has changed some since Luther's Germany. That's the farthest back I can trace it. From what I can tell, it's an Ashkenazi Jewish name. The name means long chain. It's a combination of, the, of, of the both German and English words, long and link. So like a link in a chain and long like, well, long. <laughs> and so... L-A-N-G-K-E, Lunk, and what it means is long chain. Now, they used it to describe a slave. I use it to describe covenant faithfulness. And I tell Hazel, God named you Ling 
because you are to be one link in a long chain of believers. And I tell that to all my children and to our family. I'll go through Peter's really quickly. Peter is, of course, the High King in Narnia, which is his Narnia name and his first name. His first name also is, of course, the Apostle Peter. I mean, come on now. Uh, and just generally, I've always held it in connection with kings and people who are firm rock, uh, rock solid people. Obviously, Peter meaning rock or stone. <clears throat> and so. I tell him, I named you Peter so that you would be a rock-solid high king. His middle name is Cademan. Cademan, of course, being the uh, Middle Ages lay person who became an elder in the church, who was inspired by a dream uh, and given the ability to sing and speak the gospel that he always so dearly wanted. And so I tell Peter, I named you Cademan so that you would be an inspired bard. So a rock solid high king and an inspired bard. So skipping over Narnia, since he already has one, we have Lord of the Rings. His Lord of the Rings name is Anduril. The name of Aragorn's sword, meaning flame of the West. And I simply tell Peter, I named you Andoro so that you would be a flame of the West. Then, moving on to his Albion name. His Albion name is Hlu. That's L-L-E-W. Connecting to the Celtic god, Celtic deity Hlu, who was god of light. Uh, but also in the story is our main protagonist. He is a person from our world who goes into the other world and becomes High King over the course of many crazy and ridiculous events. And what I tell Peter is, I named you Hlu so that you would be a High King of Light. And lastly, his Wingfeather name is Armelan. Armelon's a small part in the Wingfeather saga. He's toward the beginning of the first book, and he's a good chunk at the end. He is based on Rich Mullins, hence R. Mullen, Arm, Uh He is a barefoot bard who goes around and tells stories and tells people, fangs are ugly. <laughs> For those of you who know the story, you'll know what that means. I won't go into an explanation. So I tell Peter I named you Armulan so that you would be a barefoot bard that would travel and tell of your joys. So all of those together, you know, we have Peter, Caveman, Andorra, Hlu, Armil, and Ling. And I tell him the same thing about Ling that I tell Hazel. Now, I won't go into explanations between me and Casey, but ours are Joshua, David, Reepicheep, Bilbo, Tegid, Artham, Ling, and hers are Casey, Angelica, Lucy, Goldberry, Gowen, Sarah, Ling. And if you know the stories, you can probably guesstimate what those mean to us. But the point that I'm getting at with all of these names is that they will remember these names as they grow. And they will learn more and more and more and remember and identify with what God speaks to them in Scripture by their name. This happened to me growing up, just with Joshua David. My mo mother always told me that she named me Joshua so that I would be a warrior for Christ. And David, so that I would be a king and a, and, and, and a man after God's own heart. And, you know, we grew up in a very musical family and all that followed as well with the Psalms. And so these are signposts that point us back to the gospel. And when you name someone, when they are branded with that name, they can't forget it. And so in a very real sense, I am branding my children with the gospel. And I think that we should be doing this with our fiction characters. We should be doing this with anyone 
that we have authority over, we should even be doing this with the things that we name. We actually name our vehicles. Uh, it's a funny little tradition we have. We alternate between male and female. Uh, we're currently on Casper. Our van is called Casper. It's a big white van. And, you know, Casper the friendly ghost. So it was just a fun little thing, you know? But even something as simple as that, it denotes character. Adam named the animals. He named Eve woman. His naming was an exercising of his rightful authority from God. And when he names a thing, when man names a thing, when Christ names us, with the new name written on the white stone, as it talks about in Revelation. He is exercising his authority over us. Our names, in a very real sense, should be, and mostly are, the breadcrumbs that drive us back to Christ, that point and hint the way back to the Scripture. So if my children were ever taken from me, separated from me, somehow we passed away, whatever the case was, The fact is their names, their very names, are sermons to them. They are telling them who they are. Andrew Peterson has a song called Dancing in the Minefields. Uh, It's a very famous old Christian song. A lot of people have used it as their first dance at their weddings. There's this one part in it that says, So when I lose my way, find me. And when I lose Love's chains bind me at the end of all my faith to the end of all my days. When I forget my name, remind me. And that's a picture of what a husband and wife are to do to each other. They are to remind each other who they are in Christ. And that's why we christen our children. We are reminding them who they are in Christ. And so, we need to take names very seriously. But not in some silly, solemn kind of way. We need to be thinking about names in terms of what is this thing and what is it for? What did God create it for? What did God, by you, want to speak to this person, creature, thing. And that's basically my general's report. This has been Joshua David Ling. You can check out more at joshuadavidling.com. I look forward to hearing from you. Drop me a line, joshuadavidling at gmail.com, or you can just call or text me, 770-814-1849. That's right. That's my real personal number. I look forward to hearing from you, and I'm excited to go forth Take dominion and name things. Talk to y'all soon.